Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. My book is built around the modern economies that arose in the 19th century, first in Britain and America around 1820, later Germany and France. The world marveled at the sustained growth of productivity and wages that those economies achieved and transmitted to a degree to other economies through trade and capital flows. Other nations, of course, copied their new products and new methods. Yet the world realized that the prospering or flourishing achieved in the modern economies could not be so easily copied. It's safe to say that never before had sustained prospering or flourishing been in the reach of, of large and increasing numbers. Prior to the first modern economies, economic knowledge, hence productivity, was virtually stagnant. The mass prospering and the economy-wide productivity growth that came with it were brought by mass innovating, though the historians uh, spoke only of resources, efficiencies, and increasing returns to scale. In Britain and America especially, there was a welter of innovations in products and methods, most never to be well known. In 1840s Britain, new companies were forming <clears throat> so fast that Parliament, wearying of issuing, issuing charters, passed the Joint Stock Act of 1844. In an 1858 lecture, Abraham Lincoln said of America that there was a perfect rage for the new. The modern economy did not produce mass innovation through a succession of generally exogenous discoveries by scientists and navigators, as the German historical school thought. And the commercial applications of those discoveries by entrepreneurs. The modern economies possess their own dynamism, by which I mean the desire, capacity, and scope to innovate. With this dynamism, they were capable, on a good day at any rate, of indigenous innovation. The system of dynamism was more effective the more open it was to contributors down to the grassroots. And the modern economies were rather open to the grassroots. They saw a massive outbreak of tinkering, imagining, and experimenting. And this dynamism ran high to the middle of the 20th century. No wonder there was mass flourishing, and no wonder productivity growth was so fast. No economy before drew on the imagination of a wide range of the nation's minds. This dynamism, of course, required entrepreneurs and financiers, yet dynamism further required innovators Innovators were needed with the insight, imaginativeness, and vision to dream up new products that might well work and change practice. Innovators will often have to buck conventional thinking or break away from traditional ties. Innovations also require a social and political climate that accepts them despite the disruptions they cause. Modern economies brought a range of material benefits including increases in productivity and wages, better health and increased longevity, decreases in poverty and pauperism. The most radical impact of the new economies, I argue, was non-material. It changed the very nature of life and work where uh, the modern economy uh, took root. The new regimes of continual change created an infinite series of stimulating new challenges to overcome and new heights to scale, resulting in previously unseen possibilities for self-realization at all levels of society. 
The adventurous and exploratory spirit of these modern economies also affected uh, the arts of the period, from music to painting to literature. This transformation depended on the development of institutions that enabled dynamism, including legal protections of various rights, law, governing corporations, and financial institutions. The real crux, though, is the rise of modern values. These modern values can be, be roughly grouped under the headings of individualism, vitalism, and self-expression. So, the slow accretion of these modern values finally achieved the critical mass necessary to fuel uh, the desire in individuals uh, to innovate, to spur the capabilities required to innovate, and to boost the willingness uh, of society to give wide scope for innovation. There may be countervailing values uh, present in a society, or opponents of innovation may stifle the expression of modern values through uh, innovation. The modern values that I was just talking about arose with the onset of uh, what Jacques Barzin called uh, the modern era, roughly from 1490 to 1940. These modern values paralleled the elements in the modern conception of the good life, the basic concept of which started with Aristotle. The sort of prospering <clears throat> that came to the economies of dynamism is a specimen of, of the flourishing that uh, the philosophers and humanists uh, were, were talking about. Modern values stir a desire to flourish. In a nation where they prevail, they tend to generate an economy that offers an economic life that gratifies those desires. Of course, this philosophical heritage uh, of the good life uh, belonged to the world. But it's implicit in the book's thesis that some of the nations did not embrace it strongly enough to incorporate, incorporate it into their values. The fluctuations and disparities in outcomes, and even in prospects, typical of modern economies, caused a socialist reaction to those economies. Some nations moved part, way, part of the way toward a socialist economy, seeing more planning and more extensive state ownership as a step on the way to stability and equality. Generally speaking, the socialists sought the greater development of people's capacities to produce, but showed no consideration or awareness of the deeper goals of individuals, the non-material rewards deriving from a life of self-expression, such as exploration and creativity. The rudderlessness and the social upset wrought by the modern economies caused a corporatist reaction having overtones of the traditional values found in the Middle Ages and even in the mercantile capitalism of later centuries. Corporatists hated new enterprises invading towns. They hated new money upsetting traditional ways, wealth, and status. And there was a profound revolt against individualism and self-expression. The corporatists erected institutions and adopted policies aimed at coordination across the economy, social protection, and significant control over some industries. These corporatist economies were also conspicuous for their patronage and lobbying not to mention cronyism and nepotism. They promised to produce innovation. Mussolini was very firm about that, but they made little provision for it. As it turned out, these economies were so woefully lacking in innovation, indigenous or even exogenous, that they were unable to realize their own goals. The thesis is tested 
in my book by using the prevalence of certain values reported in household surveys uh, to represent the strength of modern values. Like, when you look for a job, do you look for a job that's interesting? When you look for a job, do you look for a job that will uh, allow you initiative? If my thesis is right, we should expect that a population subscribing to modern values will forge careers and seek jobs that are interesting, involve initiative, offer change, and, pres and present challenges. In nations where modern values prevail, the economy evolves into a modern shape to deliver the jobs that participants want, the jobs that they say are satisfying. Nations where values are prevailingly traditional are stuck with corporatist economies and tend to report mediocre or poor job satisfaction. Unfortunately, uh, by the early 1970s, um, evidence of a de deterioration in the functioning of the modern economies was undeniable. In Britain and Germany, later France, the damage to indigenous innovation, to dynamism, appears to have been severe, though concealed for a long time uh, by continuing technological transfers from America. In America, growth of productivity also uh, declined sharply uh, in the early 1970s. Growth of productivity was almost halved, cut in half, between 1922 and 1972, and the period 1973 to 2012. In all of these nations, unemployment expanded and previous gains in inclusion were lost. Apparently, indigenous innovation had sagged, dragging job satisfaction down with it, not only in America, but across all the once dynamic nations. Many factors, I think, contributed to the decline of dynamism and innovation. One was a new short-termism in corporate management. Another was failures of judgment in the banking industry and in government policy. There was a revived materialism and sense of entitlement across the culture. What may be most important is that modern values, while they may have been holding up, came to be hamstrung by a resurgency of traditional anti-modern anti values. I suggest that a new corporatism uh, came to America. In this new corporatism, companies are less interested in innovation than in rent-seeking. Elites in government play a large role in influencing the directions of a nation's attempts at innovating. And those who would like to try to develop their own ideas must overcome the pull of family and friends and the increased prestige of other sorts of lives. By focusing on material objective, objectives, conventional partisans of both corporatism and capitalism, it, this is a sort of a plague on both your houses paragraph, uh, are missing the point. The point that it is the non-material rewards of the modern economy, the good life that it makes possible, that are the distinctive gift of the modern economy to societies. A good economy is one that permits and fosters the good life, the life of flourishing for its participants. John Rawls remarks somewhere about how an economy that has gross inefficiencies, even if it appears just on the surface, can't be just if it's tolerating just, just, uh, in, such inefficiencies because everybody's worse off than they could be. That's not just. <clears throat> Similarly, if, if nobody is having a good life, even though on the surface the economy appears to be perfectly just, uh, it's not really a good economy. Of course, in order to be just, 
a good economy must provide opportunities for the good life to those who aspire to it. A modern capitalist economy, when it is functioning well and justly and buttressed by modern values through the population, is justified. In order to regain the West's past glory and to resuscitate the good economy, widespread indigenous innovation and grassroots dynamism must be restored. Institutional and policy fixes can help, but the economy is not a machine that can be cranked up or down at will. It is a living, organic entity, composed of all those individuals who participate in it and their ideas and culture. The mix of modern values that first brought forth the modern economies must be re reaffirmed and strengthened if the nations of the West are to have a future of mass flourishing.